So, today's lecture is on damage stability. Now, the, the, you have already learnt about intact stability that means, the stability of the ship uh, which was calculated in the uh, undamaged condition or in the intact condition. Now, uh, in the damage stability that we have to calculate the, uh, uh, the configuration of the ship in the damaged state. Now, damage stability actually there is the what are the causes of damage? There are some number of causes of damage are there. So, but eventually we find that it all leads to loss of watertight integrity. What loss of watertight integrity of the hull of the ship. Now, in the intact condition of the ship, we had calculated the stability was calculated uh, considering the hull to be a watertight envelope. The hull was considered to be a watertight envelope, and there were no there were no means of flooding the hull through any openings either on the side or on the bottom or through the down flooding uh, openings in the ship that is your ship's ventilator or whatever openings are there on the uh, main deck. So, the hull was essentially a watertight envelope of the ship. So, when one designs the hull form of the ship that is the lines drawing, so he actually makes this watertight envelope. Now, this watertight envelope contributes uh, to the so called buoyancy and stability. So, buoyancy and stability is contributed by this watertight envelope. Now, if this watertight envelope is damaged, that is, if there is a breach in the hull, then of course, we will not get the required amount of buoyancy. So, breach in the hull leads to so that means the, the naval architects and uh, uh, other engineers they try to protect this watertight envelope so as to have sufficient buoyancy and stability of the ship in the event of damage. So, we will talk about the uh, later in case of subdivisioning, how to prevent the watertight en envelope being completely flooded or we have to restrict the flooding of this watertight envelope. Now, before that, when we are studying the damage stability, we will consider the ship to be already subdivided by bulkheads. So, this was uh, this what is called bulkheading of the ship was very um, it was a very old practice and there was a record in history in Marco Polo. Marco Polo actually observed this watertight bulkheads in Chinese junks. Of course, that was in the 12th century.
Now, the damage stability, obviously, we are considering how best to restrict the uh, flooding of the hull and these bulkheads are there in order to prevent the progressive flooding of the internal spaces. Now, the, the question comes that this spacing of the bulkheads have to be done scientifically or on what method we are going to space these bulkheads. So, this has led to a study of course, uh, after the titanic disaster and uh, if one wants to uh, study the damage stability of the ship, he has to uh, uh, normally uh, go into the what is called the IMO rules. This IMO rules, the International Maritime Organization, formerly it was called SOLAS, they have successive conventions. Say after every say four years or five years, they have conventions and ships that have already damaged or already that have gone sunk and what are the causes of damage are studied and then some uh, rules are propagated which to minimize, by which to minimize the damage. Now, uh, before that of course, uh, if one wants to study subdivisioning, that means the previously of course, not so much uh, uh, theory was developed in order to subdivide the hull, but nowadays you will find gradually the probabilistic method has come up in order to subdivide the hull into number of bulkheads. So, the uh, most uh, new, of course, I will not be talking about this now. The recent approach is your probabilistic method. this probabilistic method of subdivision. And this is the most modern method that has come up. Now, why it has come up? That is, uh, we have the uh, successive ship disasters have been uh, studied and the major two points that have been the, the you have to get the probability distribution was formulated the probabilistic method you will find that there is a probability distribution of damage. Now, this has an extensive study was done in the university by the University of Newcastle and they uh, propagated, uh, they formulated this probabilistic method, which was later incorporated in the rules. So, this is probability distribution of damage. Now, here, of course, uh, this will come later after we studied the consequence of how to analyze the damage. So, probability distribution of damage actually refers to two types of distributions. You will find one is the primary concern is about damage location. So, this is very important damage location. So, and another factor that is very important is extent of damage. So, these are the two factors which influence the definition of your probability distribution. A probability distribution is nothing but a frequency distribution curve incorporating both these uh, two aspects that is your damage location and also the extent of the damage. Now, this uh, in your recent uh, analysis uh, one uh, finds that there is a, uh, a rigorous study with the number of combinations of various combinations of the compartments. If one looked into the previous uh, IMO rules, then, then you could have come across say one compartment ship or a two compartment, two compartment ship which was specified. That means, the ship was able to float uh, in a uh, uh, what is called a you know, without endangering the personnel on board 
with one compartment flooded or with two compartments flooded. Now, in the present uh, rules, that has completely been replaced by your probability distribution of damage. So now, in, if one wants to find this, then one has again to formulate what is called the probability index. So your your survival is now indexed in terms of a numerical uh, what is called numerical quantity and the classification or the IMO specified that the required ship is to have a subdivision index greater than certain value say at end subdivision index. Uh, of course, that will come later. So, this is the main gist, but you will find that uh, in today's calculation of damage um, which incorporates both your uh, calculation of damage location and extent of damage, there are two other important uh, things which you have to which have to be calculated that is the uh, reserve buoyancy. Reserve buoyancy is, is a must for survival. If the ship does not have adequate reserve buoyancy, that means it is also it is in the danger of foundering or, uh, or sinking. So, if one wants to study this reserve buoyancy again, one has to refer to what is called your load line rules. I think most of you have come across this. So, this is called your load line rules. They specified the amount of reserve buoyancy that is required for a vessel that is required for a vessel to fly in certain uh, oceans of the water at specific time of the year. So, this is called the load line rules. So, if uh, one uh, uh, this damage stability is nothing but uh, a part of the safety of the ship. So, if one is concerned about the safety of the ship, then one has to constantly <coughs> refer to these two rules which are of paramount importance that is your IMO rules. This has to be referred and of course, your load line rules. Now, the ship unless it satisfies these two uh, <coughs> rules that is your IMO and load line rules that is it is not going to be certified by the surveyor. It has to meet the minimum uh, conditions as stipulated in these IMO rules and your load line rules. Now, I am not going to too much details into the load line rules. You will find that the load line rules also has uh, besides uh, the stability is not so much important there. Of course, it is uh, dealt with your strength parameter etcetera free board uh, uh, your shear <coughs> etcetera how much it contributes to the reserve of buoyancy. So, from the load line rules one has to decide upon the that is the maximum permissible draft of the vessel. So, that is important. So, the draft is the determining factor of the reserve buoyancy which the or the free board which comes from the uh, this load line rules. Now, these IMO rules you will specify the minimum amount of stability that is required in the ship and this stability of course, is um, stability you can only be measured in terms of the minimum amount of GM that is required for a certain type of ship say uh, and also we, we describe in when it comes we talk about st stability there are two things which are in important. One is your minimum GM. This of course, varies from uh, ship type. So, your tanker will have some uh, GM value, your cargo ship will have some other GM. So, minimum GM is a criteria for stability and also the GZ curve. So, GZ curve that is pertains to a range of stability over a given angle of heel. So, that gives me the that gives us the talks about the uh, stability of the ship when it is undergoing a certain amount of heel. So, these are the two minimum GM and GZ curve these specify the required amount of stability to be there in the ship for safety reasons. 
So these are uh, specified in your IMO criteria. So uh, we are concerned now, um, right now this uh, subdivisioning will come later, but now we have to calculate what is the damage condition of the ship. Say <coughs> the ship is from the intact condition or the ship actually has a number of service conditions. Service conditions of the ship that is the ship is floating at one of these service conditions. So normally you have uh, the fully loaded condition. Then you have partially loaded condition. And next, you may have a ballast condition. So this depends on whether the ship is arriving at a certain port of call or it is leaving up a certain port with either a fully loaded cargo or partially loaded cargo. So these, the stability booklet that uh, one uh, makes, that is the shipyard will make will normally have these three conditions. It may have certain other condition, uh, more conditions, but some of these three conditions are normally required by the surveyor. So here, so this one of these service conditions can be taken as the initial condition. So initial condition at which the ship floats. Now damage stability means the or the calculation of the damage stability re requires that one calculates the final draft of the vessel after say the ship has undergone a certain collision or a certain damage to a watertight com compartment. So from initial condition Calculate the final damage condition. Now, this final damage condition obviously means the damage draft of the ship and the amount of heel or trim, of course, that the whatever the mainly one has to calculate your sinkage. Then we have to calculate trim and also heel. So these are the three things that one has to calculate in the damaged condition of the ship. So this for final, you write final damage draft of the ship. So this has to be found out from the initial condition. Now um, obviously we assume uh, that the uh, ship is, has been divided into a specific number of bulkheads. So ship uh, has been So this is the first assumption or we uh, instead of assuming the ship not to be divided by bulkheads, we take that the ship has already been designed into say a number of bulkheads and if one is interested you can just calculate the number of bulkheads 
that is in the classification society rules. You look uh, in Lloyd's, it is given according to the length of the ship. And normally, a ship, the number of bulkheads, every ship has uh, these three bulkheads that is, your four peak bulkhead, four peak bulkhead is there. Then it will al always have an aft peak bulkhead. And this is a must and your engine room bulkhead. Now, if it wants to have a quick reference for the location, it depends on the length of the ship and also the type of the ship. You can look up any other classification society rules. Of course, these are rules also specify uh, minimum number of bulkheads. Now, he, of course, one can put any number of bulkheads as he wishes in, into the ship but it will not provide any uh, um, uh, useful, too many, <coughs> too or rather too much bulkheading is not desirable. Why? Because it will hamper the movement of personal and cargo. They imagine the ship has very small compartment. You know? I want absolute say 100 percent safety of the ship against flooding or sinking. So, it, I can divide the ship into as many number of smaller compartments as possible so as to restrict flooding. But you will find that this increases the cost of the ship that is So, first is increase of cost and hampers with movement of cargo, hampers with cargo loading and unloading. And in some ships actually you will find in roll and roll of ships, the decks are free of any bulkheads that is they have continuous decks that is for the uh, uh, your trucks or your cars to pass from one end of the ship to another. So, you cannot have bulkheads over there and lot of accidents have prior to your probabilistic calculation of the uh, stability, lot of accidents had taken place in ferries. Ferries and rollo, rollo ship actually these type of ships they have very few bulkheads because of the fast turnaround of the ship and also of the movement of the <coughs> vehicles inside the ship. So, they are more prone to sinking. More prone to flooding and because there is unhindered flow of water and lot of accidents have taken place especially in the North Sea where the front part of the bow that was the visor has been kept open and the captain who was not, not very cautious, the ship tried to sail off with the, the bulkhead or the front bow was not being closed and the whole deck was flooded and ultimately it capsized. So, these types of ships, they have rather free decks, large free decks for vehicle movement. Uh, these ships are more prone to flooding. And other ships of course, one has to be very careful in uh, other ship types which are prone to flooding is you will find they are called open hatch container ships. So, 
so um, I have told you that the if you want to restrict flooding or if you want to have you know, sufficient buoyancy to the ship, buoyancy and stability, they are primarily given by the watertight en envelope of the vessel. That means the watertight envelope in no case should be breached or it should be pierced. If it is done, then you will have the you know, ship to be flooded. Now in the open hatch container ships, of course, these type of ships have come because of the quick turnaround time that is required for taking out of the containers. We have done away with the containers, but these ships have to be built for a certain route and they should have large high free board. So normally what is done, that means these ships are tank tested in a certain sea state such that the waves do not come on board the uh, or flood the holds. So uh, somehow this flooding has to be restricted and um, even when it occurs, that is the holds are flooded, you have to be quick dewatering arrangement of the holds. So these types of ships, that is your ferries, rural ships and also your open hatch container ships, they are the load line rule and also your damage stability rules are somewhat different. That means they are somewhat more stringent. And the third category of ships is your passenger ships. Passenger ships have more stringent rule for subdivision because of the value of the passengers or value of the passengers that they are carrying. So these ships have a more stringent uh, prevention for uh, flooding by having say the measures to counteract the flooding of water. So uh, flooding is always related to safety of the ship and you will find when the ship is on the sea, you are required to close all the you know, bulkhead doors, hatches, etc., such that the watertight envelope is maintained. Of course, the causes of flooding can be grossly different. I have not told you about the causes. So causes can be say, you know, one is uh, collision. Collision can cause a breach on the hull of the ship. Then you have say grounding. Grounding is another accident which can cause um, flooding, causes of flooding. Collision grounding and the other cause is ships normally have fire. Fire hazard is another very important factor which damages any ship. So all the ships nowadays you have fire alarms and fire safety of the ship is a paramount. So collision, grounding, fire, these are the primary causes of flooding. Of course now fire actually uh, we cannot prevent fire of course by if you look into the IMO rules uh, it also states how to restrict the spread of fire in the various compartments by uh, segregating your ventilation ducts or preventing the passage of fire. So for that you have to design the ship into some fire zones or segregate the various zones of the ship both vertically as well as horizontally in order to restrict what is called spread of fire. So that is, uh, this is also an important category. This is of course does not relate to uh, down flooding. Of course, once fire erupts in a particular hole, then the ship is damaged and also there is risk of water entering a certain hole. Now this collision and grounding, normally in ships, uh, this we can prevent the flooding by having uh, what is called wing bulkheads and also a tank top. So previously the tankers they were called single bottom tankers. That means um, for tankers normally there is a the large chances of grounding because of the deep draft of the vessel. It comes into a 
shallow uh, river, then you undergo grounding. So they did not, previously the large tankers, they did not have any tank top. So nowadays, uh, I think above 30,000 tons, you are required to have a double bottom. And also specific wing tanks are there in order to spread, uh, prevent this, the flooding of the uh, internal hold of the ship. So these are some of the restrictions that have come into force. So these are the causes of flooding are collision, grounding, spread of fire. Now, so we have discussed that too much subdivisioning actually leads to increase in the cost of the ship and it will hamper the uh, passage of your uh, personnel and also the cargo. And uh, so we have to strike a balance that is there is a trade off that is in every uh, ship or in every venture you will find there is a trade off between safety and cost. This is always the case. So that means the uh, classification rule states the minimum amount of bulkheads you can put in your ship. But of course, you can keep on, one can go on bulkheading the ship as much as it likes, but it will really push up the cost. So between safety and cost, there is always a relation and one has to trade up one, one has to think about the ultimate uh, safety of the vessel um, in the lifespan of the ship. That is a ship, it will be in its uh, uh, service life will be uh, say around say 15 or 20 years. What is the probability that the ship is not going to sink or suffer uh, uh, damage before it became, goes out of, because it is lost or goes out of operation. So now there's a lot of probabilistic studies are taking place in order to um, either to bring down this cost and enhance the safety. The engineers will always try to enhance the safety and the owner will always think about reduction of the cost. So the two are the going against each other. Anyway, now let us come actually to the uh, calculation of the uh, damage stability. So the calculation part, uh, if one wants to make, say let us assume that a ship is floating at a certain draft in the intact or in the previously undamaged condition. So this is the midship portion, which of course I'm marking like this. And let us assume that the forward compartment, compartment forward of midship has been damaged. So this is the compartment. Now inside the compartment, there may be a tank top which has not been damaged. Say or as step in the double bottom. So this portion is your intact, giving you the intact buoyancy. And the hatch portion has been damaged. So this was the original water line. So let us call this as WL. And your final now the ship, uh, if a uh, forward compartment is damaged or it is open to the ship, then uh, the draft forward will be more. That is, there is going to be a bow trim on the ship. So your eventual water line will look like this. Say this is, let us call this WL2. Now, if one wants to calculate the final condition or the final draft of the ship, we have to assume two things which are happening. One is the ship is undergoing a parallel sinkage at a certain water line, which let us say we can call this as WL1. And the final 
draft or the final water line is WL2. Now there are two methods by which we can do this. That is two methods of calculating the final draft of the ship. Final draft of the ship in the equilibrium condition. That means the ship has not sunk, but it is floating at a certain draft and we have to calculate what is that draft of the ship. So this can be done by two methods. One is called the lost buoyancy method. And the other is called the added weight method. Now, both these methods have certain advantages and disadvantages. <coughs> the main advantage is that in the if we if one uses the lost buoyancy method, then one can base his calculation on the original draft, on the original condition of the ship. So this is based on the original draft, that is the undamaged draft of the ship. From here we begin. And the, in the added weight method, of course, with the ad, uh, advent of the computer, etc., this difficulty is somewhat overcome. You have to assume the final draft of the vessel. Assume final draft. And then make a number of iterations by which the um, you get the final condition or the stable equilibrium of the ship. That is, you have to do the calculation based on number of draft of the ship. So this, of course, the second method actually it will involve a lot of iterations and it's a time-consuming approach. But it is better to go by the lost buoyancy method. Now. The second method actually is more convenient if the uh, water which floods the compartment is restricted in its upward direction. That means there is a watertight flat or there is a tank top by which you can calculate the net amount of added weight which goes into the ship. Otherwise, the first method is more preferable. Now, in the first method, that is, the, let us discuss this lost buoyancy method. Now, here, that is, we make, we start off with buoyancy that has been lost is equal to the buoyancy that is gained. So here actually the ship submerges to a deeper, deeper draft and of course it, the intact portion of the ship gains in buoyancy. So the amount of buoyancy that has been lost is equal to the buoyancy that has been gained. And the second part of the calculation one makes about the calculation of sinkage. Calculation of sinkage, trim and heel. of 
remaining intact part of the ship. That is the undamaged part of the ship. Of course, the amount of water that has gone inside the vessel, that means the vessel is open to the sea at that uh, you know, floodable volume. So, we are not bothered about that, but we are bothered about that part of the ship which is giving buoyancy. So, from that we have to calculate your sinkage, trim and heel. The only uh, factor is that the form of the ship will be somewhat different from the previous form. So, this is your lost buoyancy method and uh, in the added weight method, so let us call this A. B is the added weight method. Now, added weight method you have to assume this is very important assume an equilibrium draft. So, here actually it is different from your lost buoyancy where we need not assume any draft, but our calculation actually starts from the initial condition of the ship that is the original draft of the vessel. But here we have to assume the added weight method you have to assume an equilibrium draft uh, in the damaged condition. Now, this draft may not be the actual draft but you have to find out the actual uh, draft by doing a number of iterations. Now, next is calculate flood water up to this water line. So, one assumes the equilibrium draft, then you calculate the flood water that is the amount of water that has gone inside the ship. Now, next you subtract weight of flood water. and its moment from the total dis the displacement from from the total uh, displacement uh, in the new condition of the ship or in the damaged condition of the ship. So, that means you have to do two things, you have to assume a damaged draft and you have to find out the displacement at the damaged draft and then subtract the weight of flood water. Similarly, you do this calculation for the moments, that is the moments are required in order to calculate the trim and heel. So, from this damaged condition you subtract moments of the flood water. Subtract moments. of flood water 
to get to the previous undamaged condition of the ship. So, this undamaged condition of the ship should match your initial starting condition. So, till you come to this stage, you have to constantly go on iterating the uh, amount of buoyancy that is the amount of uh, volume and also its moment. So, this involves number of iterations. Now, if you want to do this by hand, one can do it by hand, but the calculations are time consuming. That is, one has to calculate your the parallel sinkage then trim and heal at all these drafts till one comes to the final uh, that is the previously obtained draft at which the ship was floating. This of course, to correspond damage condition of ship. So, these are the two different aspects of these two types of method and uh, one has to judge which method is going to use such that it takes the minimum amount of calculation time. Now, one should remember the two things that is the lost buoyancy method whenever one makes the calculation there is no change in displacement That means, the initial displacement is equal to the final displacement. 